standard. And of course, you will never get everyone on board. But the easier that we, the easier that we make it for tools to take each other's inputs and outputs, the easier that it will be for people to have more choice in in choosing whatever tool they want. So I do think that there, there definitely is a place alongside, you know, independent tool development. We're trying to make sure that we're working to some kinds of standards so that our tools are actually in trouble. All right, so thanks for that. So another question from uh, Gerard Mboa, he's asking, does having different variants of concern emerging from different sections of the tree mean that we have different pressures driving the SARS-CoV-2 viral evolution? And if so, do you have so any So this is the question part where Dr. Emma yeah, is so responding a, to several sorry. questions. Yeah, okay. Um, so th that's a great question. And, and I, I think that it's hard to say for sure, um, but in general, I think it's very possible that that this is the case. So in particular, you know, with, with alpha, it didn't have, that was the first variant of concern. It didn't have a big change that in the antigenicity, able to but it talk had a big about change in transmissibility. And actually for a few of the, how those kind of early variants of concern, we saw this, the transmissibility seemed to be the, the big advantage. And that makes sense because transmissibility, you know, even like kind of disregarding omicron, most other alpha, things, as long as you haven't lost the delta, out it, the beta, and the gamma, those are the several variants of the COVID-19. Then this is, this is going to be an advantage. You'll move faster than whoever you're replacing. But now going forward, we've seen more variants that have had changes in um, immune recognition as well. Of course, Omicron really standing out from this crowd. But we saw this earlier with, with variants like beta, which also had some pretty significant antigenic changes. And importantly, a few of these may have come from countries where they've had larger outbreaks. So where the population immunity might have been higher, and there might need, be more selection pressure to get around that immunity. Of course, now we're in a pretty different phase of the pandemic where a lot of people around the world have been vaccinated or infected or both. And so a lot of people have immunity. So we might expect now that there's more pressure or more success to be gained from getting around that immunity in some form or fashion. Of course, transmissibility is probably also a good bonus as we saw, you know, Delta, BA1, BA2, increasing transmissibility. And so if that of can be combined in there as well, those, we might have very uh, features that are, that are more transmissible so still in that Delta B1, But Delta I think that B2, still makes it hard to know what to expect in, in the future. Of their transmission you know, a lot of it will depend on the constraints of the virus very and how strong those selection predicting are. Future okay. pandemics. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question from Paul Akinduti in the chat uh, forum, and he's asking, what is the effect of immune profiles of individuals from different racial groups on the mutation of SARS-CoV-2 variants? So that's an interesting question, and, and I, the short answer to that is that I don't know. I don't know if there's been a real investigation on the inherent differences, for example, in people from different racial or different ethnic backgrounds around the world, and the mutations that we might see in response to their system for SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any, and we might expect that for a fairly uh, novel virus, we may not see too many. I want to be very careful here because there have been some studies that have suggested this, or not even studies may be a strong word. There's certainly been some speculation in the media about, oh, this group of people sees more viruses, or this group of people sees more coronaviruses. We have to be very careful because I think, unfortunately, a lot of, um, a lot of these are not necessarily based in kind of hard facts, but more speculation. Uh, but as far as kind of really good studies that have looked at this at a level that it's more scientific, that's interesting, but I, I don't actually know the answer. Of course, this is very okay, interesting. Okay, so thanks for that. Uh, we have Edward Nelson Kantaka asking uh, talks of the next pandemic. Is it re reasonably possible to predict with a margin of error a time frame for the next pandemic? Uh, that's a hard question. I mean, I think that so this is, I, I guess I'll give it a, a bit of a caveat. This is far from my expertise. I generally, you know, my, my history has been studying viruses that are here. Um, so I'm not an expert in kind of pandemic prediction. I personally would say that it's very hard to predict because we, you know, we're ever changing the world that we live in. And a lot of this, we, a lot of these kinds of events will be stochastic. Uh, I mean, based on the time frame, in then when the next example, pandemic we have that will strike, I should have earlier with this uh, level of stair step. We have a good idea of which stages at the end might lead to the next um, strain that circulates in the season. To but to predicting more than this turns out to be really difficult. And one idea behind why it's so difficult is just because it's stochastic. So which flu variant goes to the big conference that then gets shipped all around the world, or which one ends up getting types. into the classroom from which it infects, you know, a bunch of children who go home and infect. You know, like there's, there is a lot of stochasticity in an, in pandemics and in endemics and even in, you know, normal circulation. And unfortunately, that probably means that the same is true for pandemics as well. That it just, you know, there might be something 
terrible that jumps into someone, but if they go home and this week they just don't happen to see anyone, that's it. We just prevented a pandemic and we'll never, never know it. So for me, I think it's it's hard to predict that. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And then you've got Sikulila Mao asking, given the disparity of the level of vaccination, what do you think the next successful variant could look like? This is a tough question, and I think that this is something that is very hard to predict um, because we've seen how the variants so far have been have not necessarily been what we predicted. I think, of course, Omicron is really the highlight of this. No one saw Omicron coming. It really did come out of left field, and to me, that's a reminder that we don't necessarily know what tricks might be up the up this kind of sleeve of the of the of the virus. But to me, it really drives home the point that. We need to be prepared that different variants can have different effects in different populations because, as as Asper said, you know, vaccine coverage is very different around the world, and so is how many people have been infected. So is what people have been infected with. You know, in some regions, people mostly had Delta, in so other regions, maybe it was predict, mostly Beta or Gamma. Uh, based or on statistics, and so based that, on of the, course, also means that your immune landscape uh, is slightly different from another so person, based on the or maybe you were only infected or infected and then vaccinated. You know, all of this studies, will change what your personal immunity looks very like, and, to and it may affect you know your whole region or your whole country nature, or your whole continent. Type, and so I do think it is an important the kind of reminder effect that with that the all next this variant probably can cause. Of course, we like, phytogens, and there are um, issues on maybe anti-microbacterial anti substances. It might mean also people with different uh, it's very difficult to different be vaccines, able to predict. However, clinical studies and the scientists need to be taken into through account. And we might have one variant that's doing very well in they you know, keep this part of the world, and another variant that's doing well in this part on of the world. They could be circulating at the same time if they're able to find the niches. For example, I think it's hard to predict the probability of that, but it's something that we need to be prepared to react to if it happens. Okay, um, uh, thanks for that. And then uh, we've got uh, Sarah Don asking, are these same sources for visualization and repository in place for other pathogens? So for repositories, it's it's uh, it's a bit different. So for GIFAID, where a lot of the SARS-CoV-2 sequences are, they do influenza, they do SARS-CoV-2, and I think they do RSV now, but they don't generally do, you know, if you come along with random virus, they, they aren't. You know, they don't just take every virus, um, but for on GenBank, you can find basically everything. I mean, you can put anything on GenBank. Um, and so there, there is a lot of different viruses that are available, and you can access a lot of those through Viper, the IPR, which is like a virus database uh, tool that sits on top of GenBank. It can help you narrow down if you're looking for a specific virus. For visualizations, a lot of these, or, or just tools in general, a lot of these are, are more generic. I'd say the one divider is whether they can handle viruses and bacteria, Bacteria, of course, are enormous, um, and so not all software handles bacteria the same way or the file types that are associated with bacteria. But a lot of these software tools are fairly generic and can handle a lot of viruses. So again, next strain, we started out with influenza, and then we expanded. We've done um, Zika, we've done Ebola, we've done mumps, we've done measles. I was doing enterovirus in next strain before the pandemic, and many people have applied it to all sorts of fun things, including actually like fungus funguses and bacteria. So a lot of these tools um, are able, or I know of some tools right now that were developed for SARS-CoV-2, and they're now trying to expand into being able to handle other viruses or other pathogens. So there is a, a pretty diverse tool set out there. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that. And then we have Bamidele Iwalokun asking, is next trend group thinking of developing proteomic troops? Like trying to know the effect of mutations on mm. proteins and conformation and function? Yeah, so that's a good question. And for next strain, no. So next strain, we're really focused on being very good at providing phylogenetic and kind of phylogenetic associated um, analysis, certainly at the moment. I mean, who knows what the future will bring. Um, but certainly for things like protein structure, this is really out, out with the core expertise of the next strain team. And even though the mutations that we see on the tree can feed into these kinds of analyses, I don't. I think it would be kind of apart from our main mission to look at this directly. But certainly, what we hope is that things like what we develop with next strains. So, for example, in our open trees. So, if you look at our open builds, these are made with GenBank data, and that means that they're entirely available to download the tree, the mutations, the sequences, everything. And this can be a really useful starting point if you want to then do this kind of proteomics analysis. You can use this data to look for the mutations, how frequent they are, where they are in the tree, and then hopefully other 
people that are more brilliant and structured than we are can do this kind of analysis more effectively, perhaps. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have Esther Kanduma asking, I think still related to a previous question, uh, the number of cases are way few in the African populations compared to others. Is there any genetic evidence to explain these differences? Sorry, sorry. Of course, the genetic you just repeat evidence the beginning to explain again and why the number of COVID-19 so the number of cases are in, way few are less in, African in Africa, of course, compared to others. as compared there to other countries. Evidence to explain of course, it may not be a genetic evidence. Yes, yeah, so again, such. this is a tough <laughs> question because it's very hard to separate out the very, very different pandemic um, like patterns we've seen around, around the world from things like ethnic differences. So we know that there are, of course, genetic differences between people based on race and ethnicity, but we also know that there, you know, these are correlated very strongly with things like socio-demographic differences and differences in, you know, how households are organized or when the school years run or season seasonality. And it can be very difficult to separate these things out. That doesn't mean that you can't do that analysis. I'm not aware of data that's looked into this. That doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. But again, I would be wary, I'd be very, very careful reading analyses that, that claim to look at this because you have to be very careful to control for the many, many confounding effects that come with when you start dividing groups into kind of you know racial and ethnic backgrounds. You're also often dividing them you know, geopolitically, economically, geographically. So it's, it can be hard to disentangle those things. I'll take the last question now in the interest of time. We've got anonymous user asking, uh, with the different levels of immunities and the adherence to preventions of SARS-CoV-2, do, do you foresee the virus mutating to more virulent strains than the latter? I mean, I, so again, Emma I think this is, is a analyzing on the question. This is a uh, that have been raised to answer, by uh, but I think it's possible for me, members in different I think platforms. Is, uh, you know, there will be the, kind of a peak where the virus, you know, it, it can't become more transmissible on an infinite scale. There will be a, a limit on how transmissible it can be, particularly. With or are there other ways that it can up that transmissibility even more? If there are, I think we probably can expect that it will exploit those because being transmissible gives you an advantage. In which case we wouldn't expect to see them. I think that in the longer term, Wanes, um, but many of us have had multiple exposures or multiple um, vaccines at this point, or both. And so that immunity is probably, you know, a bit better than if we just all had had one vaccine or one infection, for example. So that I think is going to be one of the bigger determinants in the long, long term, as far as how quickly we get to things like endemicity um, and how much it can get around our immunity. But in the short term, I think it's really a question of can the virus be more transmissible? And if it can, it, it Probably will at some point, but maybe maybe it's done the best it can, and it, and it we won't see something more transmissible just because it can. All right. So I think with that, I think in the interest of time, we've got only one minute remaining. I'd really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Holdcraft, for that very wonderful presentation. I think you can see from the comments in the participation panel. Uh, so we've come to the end of our webinar. Web the next webinar will be on the 13th of April and will be delivered by Professor Christian Happy of Redeemers University in Nigeria and Professor Trevor Bradford at the University of... Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, members. We will be able to bring for you live uh, other webinars, other information thank based on much. health science, COVID-19 pandemic. Kindly keep on this channel. Subscribe for those who have not subscribed and you will be able to get more highlights. Uh, thank you, kindly support. You can be able to share more information on this. Uh, thanks so much.